I wanted to first of all uh, thank the staff of, of Lakeland College and I wanted to certainly thank the president and administrators for having me today. It's really a pleasure to, to be with you today and uh, I really treasure the experience to get out and kind of move around so I won't be standing over there. I'll be kind of moving around as I'm showing you some things today. But my purpose here today is to not only help you understand what Tourette syndrome is, uh, but more importantly, what deep brain stimulation can do for a person with Tourette syndrome. Uh, as was mentioned, I, I'm the first person in North America to undergo this procedure uh, for Tourette syndrome. There were three cases tried in the Netherlands uh, prior to this, and the success rate on redu tick reduction was uh, at best 20% in one of the, the individuals. So when I'm looking at, and you'll see shortly, and I'll take you a walk through a day in the life uh, kind of, of, of Tourette syndrome, when I'm looking at uh, a 100 percent tick reduction, I'm very, very thankful and fortunate uh, that it's happened. So again, I wanted to thank the administrator, administration, the faculty, and I certainly want to thank you. I know that you're taking time out of your day, and uh, your lunches are starting to smell up the room really nicely. So, <laughs> so. And the third thing that, that I wanted to help you uh, to understand and take from this and in the hour that we have is to take some insight. You know, if you can learn and apply this in anything in your life or someone you know or just gather information for the future, that's what I'm really striving to do today is get that information to you. So a little bit about me. Uh, I live in South Euclid, Ohio. Uh, grew up and moved around a lot with my father and as he worked in the steel industry. Uh, I have three children, uh, one of whom is about to turn one next month, so we've got a little guy r crawling around too fast for me to keep up with. Uh, I've got a daughter, uh, a son, and they are 14 and 13 respectively, and uh, my wife Deborah, who cannot be here with us today. But uh, it's been an exciting time uh, for us. and. When you think about, or when I even think about the surgery, which was back on February 9th, was the first surgery that they implanted the electrodes in the brain. You'll, you'll see that later on the video. And then uh, February 20th was the second surgery to implant the electro, or, or electrode batteries uh, and to run the current signals up to interrupt the, the abnormal flow of, of cells. Uh, I look back at that and I'm thinking to myself, even to this day, you know, I really am like a, a newborn in this world from a sensation and perception standpoint. It's very, very unique, uh, and you'll certainly see why. Uh, so being able to stand still and look at you and, and hold eye contact is something that I haven't experienced for too long, so it's, it's very thrilling for me. Um, I have a lot of interests, certainly this is one of them. Uh, this has become a primary interest for me, uh, and I look to continue uh, public speaking and going out and informing and I'm in South Euclid Lindhurst in the school district where my children attend um, I have set up an outreach program for people and families with Tourette syndrome to help them understand help them learn how to cope you know what just what do I do I'm so fed up with this you know I can't get through another day because I've been through plenty of days uh, like those and uh, fortunately was happy enough to, to be able to make that through so let me take you kind of in a, uh, a short period of time, about a 15 minute video that the Learning Channel uh, filmed of basically a day in the life of Tourette syndrome. And it'll explain, it'll go into the surgery a little bit, but it's gonna show you before and after. And my hope is that, uh, if I can operate this correctly, now my, my hope is that after you see the video, you'll be able to look at me up here and see a difference from what you're going to see up there and, and think of it from a sensation and perception standpoint and how new this is for me. So let's uh, try and get this going here. This is 30-year-old Jeff Matovic. Every minute of his life, a struggle to control the muscle spasms and tics that continuously rack his body. <laughs> Jeff is one of more than 100,000 Americans suffering from Tourette syndrome, a brain disorder that affects every aspect of his life, from daily activities like walking and eating to basic communication. How about uh, repeating, uh, it is a sunny day in Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> It is a sunny day 
in Cleveland, Ohio. Okay. <clears throat> We could go back to about age three where we noticed certain peculiar things that he would do. And you wonder as a parent, is he really strange or, you know, what's going on? I talked to the doctor about it at the time and his general rule of thumb was to tell me it was just nervous habits and tics. It's something that all kids get, he'll outgrow it in his 10th year. I just happened to be watching him from the house and he was running across the yard and he came to a complete standstill and his entire body began to shake from head to toe. That's when doctors finally diagnosed Jeff with Tourette syndrome, an incurable neurological disorder which causes rapid, sudden, involuntary movements or tics. A tic can be simple, such as coughing, snorting, eye blinking. It could be a complex series of hand movements. It can be verbal. People can uh, make obscene gestures or say obscene things. Anything else? Hey, white bull! In fact, those uh, aspects are commonly what grabs attention in the public uh, perception of Tourette syndrome. By the time Jeff was an adult, the disorder was full-blown, and the tics were non-stop. Many days, there's nothing I can do. I have to have drinks poured for me, have to be fed, have to be groomed. And that's, that stinks. That's, that's hard. On his worst days, he could barely function, and those days were becoming more and more frequent. At least six out of seven days which makes the transformation you're about to see truly remarkable. This was Jeff in February 2004. And this is Jeff just one month later. Truly, truly just amazing. My senses were completely like, what is this? Jeff Madovic is at the forefront of a major medical breakthrough in the treatment of Tourette syndrome. The story of how he got here begins with years of frustration, a lifetime spent trying to hide not only his differences, but also his pain. To be laughed at, to be pointed at wherever I went, that hurt tremendously. I don't think there's any way to explain how many years of that happening, what that can do to a person. As he grew older, Jeff's condition was treated with medication. A three-pointer. Which helped to mask the symptoms. But by the time he reached his 20s, his life had become a roller coaster. Sometimes the medications kept him in check. Other times, he teetered on the edge of control. You feel like a 24-hour, seven day a week, 365 days a year pressure cooker that there is a steam that's building up inside of you constantly that is released when you tick. But as soon as I let it out, the pressure started to build again. So it was constantly that pressure and release, pressure and release. But Jeff did manage to control things enough to start a relationship with 33-year-old Deborah Janning, who had two young children. Although at first he didn't tell her he had Tourette syndrome, she did see some clues. Occasionally, he would stretch his arm out and he would make like he was reaching for something, but it just didn't look quite natural. After three months of trying to hide the disorder, Jeff finally told her. After I had told Deborah about my Tourette's, she gave me the simple an answer of, it's okay. Basically indicating to me, I accept you for who you are. Wow, I mean, just here we are. Three months along, we were falling for each other, and now I know that it's okay. That's, that's huge. A year later, they were married. But Jeff's condition was getting worse, and the medications were no longer keeping his symptoms under control. I knew that I was backed in the corner, to put it simply. I'm 30 years old at the time, 
I've tried every med they can possibly think of. I even had a hospital say, Jeff, we don't have anything else to give you. I refused to accept that I couldn't live the rest of my life the way that I wanted to. And I was determined that I was going to get either around that wall, over the wall, or go right through the wall. In desperation, Jeff contacted the neurosurgery department at University Hospitals in Cleveland, Ohio. He had read about a revolutionary treatment for Parkinson's disease, a movement disorder which, like Tourette's syndrome, is caused by dysfunctional cells in the brain. Jeff was in dire straits and came seeking whatever help was possible. Neurosurgeon Robert Masunas and neurologist Brian Maddox specialize in deep brain stimulation, a technique which involves placing electrodes into the cells of the brain that trigger the uncontrollable movements. The electrodes are connected by wires to pacemakers implanted in the chest. These pacemakers send electrical impulses back to the brain, disrupting the activity of the dysfunctional cells. But the procedure had never been tried on a patient with Tourette's syndrome. When Jeff came to us and said, I'd like the surgery, we kind of scratched our heads and said, well, you know, there's not really a whole lot of precedent for this. Let's go look into this. Before they would even consider taking the risk, the doctors put Jeff through a battery of physical and psychological tests to determine if he would be a good candidate for the surgery. After several weeks, Dr. Masunis met with Jeff and his wife. I'm thinking to myself, okay, here comes the big no. And he looked at me and he said, we can schedule it for this. And I kind of looked and I said, What's, what did you say? <laughs> he said, let's go do this. On February 9th, 2004, Jeff entered the hospital for the experimental surgery that he hoped would change his life. Dr. Masunis begins by attaching a metal halo to Jeff's head which will be used to hold his head completely still during the operation. After Jeff was prepped for surgery, they allowed us to come back and see him. He's got these screws into his forehead, but he's still laying there cracking jokes at us, keeping our spirits light, keeping his spirits light. But at the same time, I'm thinking, this might be the last time I see my husband alive. And I kept on thinking, okay, if this truly is, I want to remember him laughing. I would remember him cracking these jokes, making everybody feel good, because that's who he is. He makes people feel good. In a separate room, the doctors study detailed MRI and CAT scans, which give them a three-dimensional map of Jeff's brain, with the metal points on the halo acting as coordinates. This will allow them to precisely target the area that's causing Jeff's symptoms. And there's our entry point here, and here's our entry point on this side. Next, a quarter-inch hole is drilled into Jeff's skull, and a tiny electrode slowly inserted deep into the right side of the brain. Amazingly, Jeff is awake during the procedure. And the remarkable thing is that they feel nothing that we're doing. You know, the brain has no pain fibers within itself. Here I am, laying down. I, I'm thinking, okay, they're inside of my brain right now. And you have the patient moving their arms and legs, speaking with us, moving their eyes and so forth. All of that enables us to more precisely hone exactly where the final placement of that electrode will be in the patient's brain. As the electrode passes through Jeff's brain, the surgeons can actually listen to the electrical and chemical signals of individual cells. The sounds help doctors distinguish normal cells from abnormal cells. I can hear a cell in a crowd of other cells and recognize it for what it is. And I'm hearing this the crack, 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 cracking of all these neurons thinking, that is my brain talking. As the doctors zero in on their target, even the slightest miscalculation can be critical. If they're just one millimeter off, it could cause Jeff to lose his eyesight or even to become paralyzed. Once the area is pinpointed, a permanent electrode is implanted. Then, the process is repeated on the left side of Jeff's brain. The entire surgery lasts eight hours. A week later, Jeff returns to have the pacemakers implanted into his chest and connected to the electrodes in his brain. Then, on March 4th, 2004, 
those electrodes were turned on for the first time. We had no idea whether there would be an immediate change, a delayed change, a big change, a small change. We didn't know in advance. We were frankly shocked. He went from having approximately one tick per second to having no ticks at all. And this was amazing. No, I've never experienced not having the compulsion to tick. And I mentioned to you before, I feel like I'm waiting for something to happen, but it just doesn't come. For the first time, I feel my right side, my right arm in particular, relax. It was, it was completely foreign to me. I had no idea what this feeling was because I had never experienced it. It was great to see him at peace inside of himself, no longer struggling with these impulses to jump out of skin. I walk in the door and there's my husband standing there. He's not shaking in any way. He's not ticking in any way. And I just go to him and I hug him, and I had my first real hug from him. And that, <laughs> that is something that is always, always gonna be one of my favorite memories. Oh. Ah. All right, Bon, you take it. For Jeff, it's the ordinary things that make life so extraordinary. And he hopes that his breakthrough surgery will soon give thousands of others who suffer from Tourette syndrome a similar life-changing transformation. Here I am, basically a brand new baby in a world of sensations and perceptions that I never knew. Loving you, babe. I know. And I welcomed it with open arms as wide as I could get them. There we go. And that's when the living began. One of, the, one of the neatest things for me, uh, you know, and I studied psychology at John Carroll University. I don't know if I mentioned that. So I'm, I'm fascinated by the brain. So when I went in for this surgery, I'm thinking, all right, they've told me all about it. They told me I'd be awake for probably 75 to 80% of the surgery. And I'm thinking to myself, all right, this could be either really, really neat or this could be really, really scary. And actually, it was a mixture of both. There were times uh, when they were drilling into my head when I felt the intense pressure of about what felt like three football linebackers on top of me. Uh, and you, know, you see a little bit of shrapnel coming from the head, but that's all anesthetized. But the interesting thing for me, and as you saw on the video, is I'm laying there and fascinated by the brain already. I'm listening to a single neuron communicating with another single neuron. I mean, picture that. I know that most of you have probably studied some type of anatomy and physiology. Think about the amazing technology that that brings about. And what I, what I hope that you can take with you today is, even if you're uh, a student here, a student somewhere else, you're a parent, you're a friend of someone, if you know what this is about and you know the technology, all of you had the great opportunity to now go out and spread the knowledge about what this procedure of deep brain stimulation has the capacity of doing for other individuals. And with that, it was, it's almost been, well, in February, it'll be two years since the, the surgeries. On March 4th is when they actually turned on the batteries, which I think is kind of neat. It's like an advanced palm pilot. They just hold up, and uh, if they do this side, it affects the right side of the body because I'm bilateral full body. So right brain is left body and vice versa. So one of the neatest things that, that I'm happy to hear is there has been a clinical trial that University Hospitals of Cleveland has uh, on, already, already uh, uh, undergone. And they have taken severe uh, Tourette's patients from all around the world. Uh, I had no idea after my surgery that this would make world news. I was thinking it'd be kind of cool if there was maybe 25% tick reduction, that'd be awesome, and uh, even if my family knew about it and a couple neighbors, that'd be cool too. But what I'm excited about and what really, really gets my attention is to see that people from Russia, people from Africa, people from all different parts of the world have called my home to, to thank me for giving them hope for their family members, 
uh, or to, uh, for the education that they've gotten and can now appreciate. But it's not that I look at that in, in an egotistical manner at all. It's more important to me that when I see university hospitals conducting this surgery, I have a friend in Mississippi, uh, as of, uh, well, we became friends about eight months ago, who underwent the surgery. He is, again, one of the less than 1% of the 100,000 people in the United States that has Tourette's that's bad enough where the medication plus therapies, typically behavioral therapies, don't work. Uh, you heard me say that you know there there were hospitals that just said we don't have anything else we're out <laughs> you know it's just it's nothing would work so Sean down in Mississippi uh, has undergone the surgery and he is now 95 percent tick free and that to me uh, is is the biggest reward uh, certainly in my life going through things each and every day to, to be able to grab a glass instead of a sipper cup. Uh, knowing that I'm not going to have a hand contraction that will shatter the glass in my hand. Those are the things that, that really keep me motivated and going today. There's another individual uh, that underwent the surgery uh, in the clinical trial who is doing very well. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to mention to you about the sensation and perception aspect is I was fortunate enough that all of the settings on the four, there are four contact points on each electrode in the brain. They're numbered zero through three. And I was fortunate enough that Dr. Masunis and Dr. Maddox were able to, as they say, tune the orchestra and get everything to operate correctly. And in doing that, you know, I walked out the same way my dad walked into that hospital with me about four hours prior, which was a very unique experience. You know, I'm walking out to the car and my dad and I are kind of looking at each other and we're waiting for something to happen. You know, all, all of my memory uh, back to as far as I could possibly remember remember this anticipation of, of tension building and release, tension building and release. So I didn't know what this still life is about. I mean, I would look at people and maybe be able to focus on them for a few minutes and I go, you know what, I bet that's kind of neat. And I always was fascinated by that. So I, I am very pleased to see that it's, it's going over and it's getting worldwide attention now. It's got the attention of the Tourette Syndrome Association. Uh, it's definitely got the attention of a lot of neurological uh, surgical hospitals and clinics throughout the world. And my hope is that more people will be able to undergo the surgery if necessary and will come out uh, on top of the game so that they can live the life that they want as well. Um, with that, I kind of wanted to mention some, some, uh, some of the symptoms of Tourette Syndrome. As you saw there, there was the grunting. Now, you'll notice I didn't have the coprolalia tick, which is the quote-unquote swearing disease as it's commonly known out on, the, out on the streets. If you were to ask people, what's Tourette syndrome? Well, it's a swearing disease. That's not it. That's one of, a, one of the symptoms that's very rare. Probably less than 10% of people actually have that symptom. But this, the symptoms for Tourette syndrome come in two different categories. They are either complex motor tics or they're simple motor tics. A simple motor tic is an individual that might have um, one, one tic that they do repeatedly, maybe a, a hand moving in and out. Okay, and it can be as frequent as, as it may be, but that's just one simple motor tic. Now, as you, saw, as you saw me on the video, mine were all over the place. You know, I, I didn't know where it was gonna strike next, which it was hard to deal with, uh, but the hyperactive cells just determine what part is going to flail out. So at that, at that point in time, you can recognize the difference between a complex motor tick, which was what I had, versus a simple motor tick. I wanted to mention, too, that most people, uh, we're talking over 99% of people, can be treated effectively uh, by medication. Some of those medications, and I've been through the, the, whole, the whole realm uh, that they can give you, are, are ORAP, uh, Clonopin. Luvox, Stelazine, Thorazine, um, Clomipramine. So these are just some of the medications. And as I flip through my papers at home and, and I look at all the different medications I've been on in the past year, I'm thinking, you know what? I should probably open a pharmacy by now. But you know, it's, it's interesting to look at because when you look at that small percentage and you also take into the consideration the factor that a lot of people, a lot of children especially, are misdiagnosed. Tourette's syndrome is very, very difficult to diagnose. And so there's a lot of people that are still out there that 
have been labeled maybe with Asperger's syndrome or with some other type of, of just ADHD, but it's going to go away. My mom was told it's just a childhood thing he'll outgrow. So it's really something that is very difficult, but when you're connected to the right people uh, that can help you, it certainly does make a difference. All right, let's talk about a little bit about the pharmacology. Uh, I told you about some of the typical drugs, and a lot of times that's paired with behavioral therapy. Now that's something that I had to go through because as I went through my life trying all these different medications, and, and if any of you have ever tried a prescription medication or any painkiller for any surgery, you know it can throw you for a loop, gives you the side effects and whatnot. And what I found very, very tough throughout my life was starting a med, going to a certain dose, living with the, the negative side effects. Sometimes it would help the ticks, but I was, I was asleep all the time. So that, that wasn't productive for me. One of the other things is, uh, you know, you have to go up and you have to find, is this drug effective for me? And if it's not, in a lot of cases it wasn't for me, so they take me down. Now I go through withdrawal symptoms and I have to get through that period of time before they put me on the next medication. So that process lasted probably close to 20 years. And when you combine that with intensive behavioral therapy, uh, where it's behavior therapy in a group setting or even in an individual setting, three nights a week for three hours a piece, you know, they're trying to get your body to relearn, to reprogram itself like a computer. So those combined can generally uh, and most often take care of the symptoms of someone with Tourette's syndrome, but in my case uh, it didn't and I was very fortunate enough uh, to have the surgery. One of the other things that, that I wanted to talk about with you is kind of getting off of the Tourette's topic for a second. We all have obstacles in life. We all have things that we have to overcome. We all face difficulties and we look at life as having ups and downs, which is natural. But one of the things that I ask you to take with you today is think about what your obstacles in life are. Think about maybe a test that you have coming up. Think about uh, home life or social life. Think of the things that are pressing for you. And then think about the gifts that you are given naturally and the gifts that you've attained through education, socialization, or other, method, other methods. And I really and truly believe that if you look at it from a perspective that all my life, I, I, yes, I faced a disorder, but I, I held a couple of things dear to my heart. Number one was a blind faith, that there was hope somewhere. When it would, when it would come about, I had no idea. So I had to wait uh, about 25 years, but I'll take that any day now. The other thing I held consistent and near and dear to my heart was determination. When we face obstacles in life, and, and, and part of the reason I'm mentioning this is because uh, when I go around to colleges or universities or my kids' classrooms, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really encouraging for me to help others understand when you face just tough times, there is a way to get through it. You know, we look at determination. Uh, relentless pursuit, you know, knowing that there's something on the other side, you just have to find a way, as I said, to get around it, over top of the obstacle, or go right through the wall if you have to, to get to it. And all of you today have an opportunity to leave this auditorium and take with you some knowledge and, and maybe even a little bit of remembrance of some of the videos that you've seen uh, today, and you have the ability to apply that. Some of you are going to be uh, x-ray technicians or some of you uh, may have even graduated that course by now. I know when I was here last time I was in a class with a bunch of x-ray tech uh, students. Some of you may be pursuing or may even have your degree in engineering, whatever it may be. But the fascinating thing to think about as you continue along your life path, wherever that may lead you, is that you have the opportunity you know, as an x-ray tech, you're now, you're now looking at x-rays of people's chests with these these microcomputers in here that you have the ability and you're going to be responsible for for taking those shots and letting the doctors know yes we see a, a slight lesion in the connection that goes and wires through the skin up behind the neck and into the brain so those are some of the fascinating things as an engineer you'd have the opportunity to build the equipment that can make all of this possible for everyone 
And, and that's what I, I challenge you to take with you is know what your goals are, know what your priorities are, and just go after it. You know, the, the saying of, of jumping in uh, the water with both feet first uh, can't be stated enough. And I hope that after seeing that video, you're able to realize that, you know what, it just takes, yeah, there's going to be some fear in life, but let's just jump in and see what, see what the cards are that we're dealt with and how we go from there. Okay, um, again, why share this information with you? Because I believe in you. If I didn't believe in every person in this room today in some way, even though I don't really know a lot of you uh, uh, on an interpersonal basis, I know that you have things out there that you're trying to achieve. I know that there are things that you're going to be able to do that are going to be special, that are going to impact others' lives. And if you look at that and concentrate on that, maybe you have kids. You know, spending time with them, I found in my life, is a top priority for me. But being able to do the simple things in life with them is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I don't want anyone to ever take those things for granted. So again, you have the ability to impact others' lives, and I challenge you to do that in any way that you can. All right, how are we doing on time here? We have about 15 minutes. Um, I'm not going to show another video right now. I was hoping to be able to show you the Oprah Winfrey video, uh, which was kind of neat, and it, but I think TLC kind of explained what was going on. What I'd like to do is I'd like to open the floor up for some, for some questions. Uh, don't hold back. I've, I've answered any type of question. Don't feel that any question is dumb or, or too personal. Uh, but I'd like to get uh, answers to you uh, so that, that uh, we can maximize uh, the time that we have together today. But before I do that, let me again thank uh, the faculty here at Lakeland for allowing me to come back today uh, to be with you and talk with you about some of this uh, information and the ways that we can all make a difference in people's lives and also if you did not get a uh, card from me with contact information please see me afterwards I do have extras in case you're looking for extra information uh, websites to go to or just want to pass the name along yes that's correct yes they, the operating table, and this is pretty, pretty exciting, you know, you talk about neat engineering, my brother's an engineer and I, would, I was sure to tell him about this, that the operating table that they put me on, and you saw the halo that was on my head, that gets bolted down so that there is no possible way that I'm going to be able to move my head. Now the rest of my body, as I'm awake through the surgery, they have to be able to tell me, you know, raise your right arm, extend your fingers. So number one, to make sure that they're not doing damage to my body, but number two, to make sure that when they hold that battery in their hand and they activate one of those leads, or the zero, one, two, or three leads, that it can calm that, that, that tenseness down. If I have tension in that arm and they're able to calm that, but I still have functionality of that limb, that's a great thing. But the operating table is designed, you're thinking about from the neck down, well, that's still, that's still ticking. Because again, I, I was full, full body, bilateral in terms of ticks. The table is very unique in the sense that if I tick and so let's say that the table shifts, the mechanism that you saw on the screen that, that dives down into the brain with the, the microphone uh, and listens for the abnormal cells so they know the exact placement, the table gives to cooperate exactly in tone with where the head is in position. So it's, it's, an, it's an amazing uh, piece of engineering that, that they came up with and were able to use. Good question, thank you. Yes? You had said that you had been 100% to free and you've not experienced anyone actually being 100% since your procedure? That's correct. Is it, because you had said communication was part of the procedure, was that a benefit in regards to placement with the conversation they could have with you? As though you were able to control some of your own destiny in that regard? Uh, you know, n yes and no. Uh, to control my own destiny, that was kind of up to the doctors and, and all the uh, sophisticated devices that they had and what they were trying to do. But to, to your point, if you have to have a person awake for this procedure. I mean, you can't have someone that has a, a tick or a movement disorder 
you know, under general anesthesia and hopefully you hit the right targets and let's get to those coordinates and, and there you go because if the person comes out, again, if they're off by one millimeter, we're talking some severe, severe things that could happen. So yes, I felt a little in control of myself and in being able to do the things that they said uh, to do and to be able to, you know, let them know, hey, I'm feeling a nice relaxation in my left arm right now. That feedback helped them to recognize, okay, we're not only hearing that we're in a place of abnormal cells that we need to stimulate through the batteries that again will provide the stimulation to slow down those hyperactive cells in the frontal lobe of the brain in someone with Tourette's syndrome. Does that answer your question? Okay. What else can I, yes? Can you go into more detail as to what kind of the simulation that's being given? Is it continuous or how many times per minute? Sure. The stimulation that, that the batteries provide is it's very, very complicated, number one, because there's, it is continuous stimulation, to, number one, to answer your question. But there's, you have to measure and they take into account, you know, we're going to, I think it's set right now for 700 um, pulses per minute right now. Okay. That can deviate. There can also be a, a differentiation in the time between the pulses. They can expand that gap before the next pulse is sent. There's voltage to consider. You know, these, these uh, microcomputers, as I call them, are run by basically a battery that has a life of three to four years. Now, what will happen, happen when that's, that three to four years is up? I often joke with the doctors, and I said, you should have just put me in a Ziploc right here or, uh, or a zipper so that you could just change it, put the battery in, and off I go. But I'll have to get that battery changed eventually. Now, with, in regard to the voltage, if I cross over 3.6 volts, which I haven't on either side yet, then you start to dip into the half-life of the battery. But there's much, much more things to take into consideration uh, when programming the battery to get the current up and to slow down those hyperactive cells. So it's a very complicated procedure that uh, I'll leave up to the doctors. Yes? Yeah, good question. Uh, if my, the question was, if my batteries start to die, will my ticks start to come back? Yes, absolutely. And one of the things is, if I have a, uh, what I call my $5,000 remote control that my kids are not allowed to touch. And it's a remote control that I carry with me everywhere. I have it in my office bag. It's about that big. And it allows me to hold up uh, to my batteries and check the therapy settings to let me know if, it's, if they're correct in their settings. Because oftentimes I would walk through a Target store and you know how they have the theft deterrent systems lined up. Well, I'm just so used to walking in that I'd walk too close to the one on this side and it trips this battery. Well, it doesn't turn off and change the therapy settings, but what it does do is it shuts the battery down. So now all of a sudden I'm bilateral boy, you know, as I'm walking through because this battery's been shut off, which means this electrode on this side's not working. Or I'm sorry, this one's not working, which means this side of me is going crazy probably within 20 seconds of that being shut off. So what I do is I simply get out my remote control, hold it up. Usually I go into the restroom, hold it up. I click it, and in about 20 seconds, I feel that relaxation come back uh, that was there before. So it's really an amazing procedure. And Dr. Maddox, my neurologist, asked me one time when I was in for uh, uh, an appointment. He just wanted to monitor things since uh, they kind of keep a close watch on me. Uh, he, had, he asked me, you know, have you ever been curious just to turn it off and see what life's like and kind of revisit the past? Because turning it off and turning it back on doesn't harm anything. Granted, I don't do that very often because I don't, I don't like to visit what uh, you saw on the screen, but I do have the ability to do that. And to your point, uh, if the battery runs low, I can see that it's running low. It'll give me a warning signal, and then it's time to talk to the doctors about a new battery. Yes? Um, sorry about a two-part question. The first part is that um, with the trials you mentioned at University Hospital, mm -hmm. if they have any early results from those trials, um, how many people were in them, and if they're experiencing some of the same results that you are if they know that yet. Um, and the second part of my question, since you said nothing is too personal, um, it, it just in terms of cost, I'm sure it was an experimental procedure that insurance companies were not wanting to cover. I, I can't even imagine what the cost is. Right, right. And, that, and those are very good questions. In order, or to answer your first question, at university hospitals, they chose about five patients. They wanted to get around five to seven patients. Again, 
you're looking all across the world for, for patients who have something severe enough that meet all the criteria. They've been through all the meds. They, they match about five checklists, five pages of checklists of material to qualify. Not to mention the battery of physical and, and psychological exams and, and the motor skill testing. So there's about three to four months of, of prep work that they have to do on you to get you ready for the surgery. Now the success rate on, uh, on, one, of the, on one of the surgeries has been very, very good. Uh, we're looking at about 90% uh, as they continue to adjust the batteries that will continue to go up. Uh, there's another gentleman that I know of who had, I believe, approximately 88% reduction and is again climbing. Now he is, he is having a little bit of difficulty with the sensation and perce perception aspect because when you're used to living in a world where you can't see straight, your eyes are always flipping all over and you all, all of a sudden placed in a world where it's still, it's quiet, you know, I can look at you, I can talk, and I can do all these things I couldn't before, that can be very, very unnerving and disruptive. So sometimes there's a need for adjustment therapy to go through that. Um, to answer your second question, we prayed <laughs> that the insurance that we had would cover this experimental surgery. And again, it's worth noting that it was experimental. Now, what we did, because the cost of the surgery is, you're looking approximately, uh, probably a quarter to a half a million dollars. Uh, and by the time I'm done with all my changing of the batteries, when I'm way down the line, it'll be much more than that. But what they did is they submitted to the insurance company as uh, deep brain stimulation for a movement disorder. Now, that's not illegal at all to do. It's done all the time. When they submit the forms for someone uh, that the FDA has approved for Parkinson's disease, they have no problem. They, they slide it by the insurance company. They read it, give it their stamp of approval, no problem. And they use the same lingo. So for, for my situation, there was no need to submit to the insurance. This is uh, a deep brain stimulation procedure for someone with a movement disorder. By the way, it's Tourette syndrome. So yes, my insurance company did cover it, and if they couldn't, uh, I wouldn't be here uh, today talking with you. But, but that is something that, uh, to get back to the insurance, is hopefully going to come along with more proven success of the surgeries. As, they see, as the FDA sees these surgeries becoming more and more successful and more clinics around the world are starting to say, hey, you know what, this worked for this guy, it's worked for this, what is the consistent variable that's repeating here? You know, where are we in the basal ganglia that's making this effect possible? So when, when that gets taken care of, then we hope the FDA will say, you know what, let's put the, let's put the AOK -okay when, when something comes across for Tourette's syndrome. Yes? Correct. Correct. There was a, a constant pressure, uh, kind of like uh, an old-fashioned pressure cooker that uh, maybe uh, my, I know my grandmother used with the top on, and it just built full, so full of steam it would start to whistle, and then you, you swear it was going to blow. That's how your body feels your entire life. And as soon as you release, in, 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 in my case, with a complex uh, musical score, if you will, it's just blotted with black ink, if you were to kind of look at it in that way, as I would release these ticks, it feels good for a second, but it immediately starts to build over and over again. Now, a lot of ticks like to repeat themselves. So if I got into my eye blinking or, or nodding my head or jerking my arm, that would kind of initiate another response of the same tick. So it was very, very hard to deal with. And again, the, the time I had tick-free was very limited. Uh, so a lot of the times I couldn't do the things that I can now do. Yes, the basal ganglia is a group of cells, uh, probably five millimeters by four millimeters in, uh, in area. And in, within that, it's, my doctors always called it high-priced real estate because when you go into the basal ganglia, you're talking about movement, speech, uh, ability to function. Uh, so the risks were paralysis, stroke, infection, um, death. Uh, they didn't know if, you know, if this would work at all. Um, and certainly other, other uh, uh, 
you know, things could have happened that, you know, aren't your typical uh, things that you worry about for a typical maybe knee surgery or something like that. So, yes, it was, it's definitely something that they took a look at. Yes? Has there been any concern that the implants in the brain move or dislodge? Good question. Um, there, it's, and that's, that's something that I found very interesting after the surgery. The, the only way and you have to remember, even though the brain doesn't have any pain fibers, so when they're in there playing around, you know, doing whatever they need to do, and I didn't feel that, the brain does swell. So after the initial surgery where they simply implanted the, the leads, or the, I'm sorry, the electrodes in my brain and left the wires uncapped, basically on the top of my head with a rubber cap around them, it's, you know, it was something where I, they had to wait until the brain started to de-swell or to come down to its regular, you know, regular format. So when you're looking at the brain and you, and you picture these electrodes stuck in the brain, when the, they have to take into consideration, and again, this just blows me away, they have to actually put those electrodes in a place in your brain, in the basal ganglia area, that, that, that they know with the amount of swelling that occurs during the surgery, when that goes down, it's all gonna settle. Kind of like uh, something that solidifies it. It'll just settle back down, and it may shift. Those electrodes may shift, but they take all that into consideration when putting them in. So, it, could could they become dislodged? Most likely not. The the wiring that I have that is is very very flexible and bendable is actually enough to suspend. One cable can suspend a couple of uh, heavy duty uh, semi trucks. So, it's it's that strong. Uh, and it's very, very light uh, too. So the, the only real way that uh, there could be a possible dislodging is if I had a very, very unusually severe blow to the back of the neck where my, where my head went this way. And all that might, might do in that situation would be to pull the electrodes back. But in terms of moving elsewhere, they're pretty, pretty uh, firmly in there. Yes? Before your operation, did anyone discuss with you possible nutritional therapy, especially use of uh, higher amounts of uh, B vitamins, things like that? Yes. I, I had seen uh, many, many dietitians. I had seen uh, uh, nutrition specialists, and, and they talked to me about, well, this food will, will, will help with reducing the stress. You know, you have so many of the, uh, the herbal medications out there now. This will reduce the stress for you, which should help you relax and reduce the ticks. This one will do this. But although that was good advice and, and good for the diet, I guess, uh, it was something that didn't work for me in terms of uh, providing the same relief that the surgery could. Yes? I'm also intrigued by these four leads. Mm -hmm. Essentially, they're uh, located at the same probe, pretty much the same place. Yes, the yes. So there must be a reason for the four leads. Exactly. Do they actually give different numbers of impulses at each lead? Yes, correct. That's exactly correct. The, the, mic, uh, the electrode is about that long. It's, it's pretty microscopic, as you saw in the video. Now, the contact points on, on, the, on the electrode, 0, 1, 2, and 3, are all programmed differently. So they actually have, when you look at both electrodes, eight contact points that they have to program to get the symphony back in, in tune and back in tempo, as you heard Dr. Masuna say. So yes. There are, some, there are some contact points that when they, when they fired up the batteries on March 4th of 2004, thank you, uh, they, they did abnormal things to me. They made my vision go blurry. I said, whoa, slow down. Let's, you know, let's take it easy here. So yes, there are different variations, and then all those settings are very, very different. What else can I answer for you? Yes? I don't see the neurosurgeon very much at all, except when I pass by and, and wave to him in his office. But I do see my neurologist on a fairly regular basis. Right after surgery, it was probably once a week that I would go in, where they just, again, look at the settings of uh, using their machine, which is a little more sophisticated than mine. And in terms of follow-up, as, as the months went by and nothing was happening, you know, they were certainly looking, you know, is there going to be a tick that breaks through here? Is there going to be something that happens that is going to be unexpected? So the doctors and the surgical teams really had to be kind of on guard and, and on call, if you will, for a series of months until it proved 
that this was going to be a lasting effect and the prognosis today is that the way that I am now will be very, very long lasting uh, for a lifetime. We're about running out of time. We have time for about one more question if there is one. Yes. Any side effects? Um, nothing but good things. <laughs> uh, I really don't feel, you know, you, you can't feel, I can't feel the, the, the electricity or the signals being sent. Uh, you know, certainly I, I'm not very large chested, but I can, I can put my hand and feel the, the battery in there. I can touch the side of my neck and what looks like a vein is actually the, the cord that goes down. Uh, so that took about you know a week to get used to, but the body will habituate to that feeling, and uh, in about two weeks' time, you don't really recognize that they're there. So no negative side effects, unless again I'm tripped off by a, a theft security system in, or in an airport in which I stay far away from that. So they have to pat me down, and I show them a card that I have implants, and uh, they go from there. Well, thank you, Jeff, for coming today and sharing your experience with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.